You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. My name is Chris Spangle, and I am excited today to talk to somebody that I followed forever. For 15 years, I've been a big fan of the 10th Amendment Center for a long time. We've never met. We've never talked. And now with uh, the expanded amount of shows that I'm doing, I am getting to interview people I've wanted to talk to for a very long time, but have not had the space uh, to do. Uh, and so with me today is Michael Bolden from the 10th Amendment Center. Their website is 10thamendmentcenter.com. And thank you so much for joining me. Dude, pretty awesome. Actually, we should be hanging out all the time. And I'm cool with being tier B. I like because you save the best for last, right? <laughs> Of course, yes. Uh, this is a guy that I've held off until you guys were really ready for the awesomeness. That's what we should really. <laughs> we just never, I've never done interviews on this program, and it was mostly an insecurity thing. I was like, ah, I'm not good at Seriously? it. Seriously? Yeah, it was. It's, it's, I don't like doing interviews generally as a host. So yeah. I've like, and I've done them in the past too, but it's a whole different thing. And it, <laughs> It takes a lot of time because you really need to know what you're talking about, about yeah. what they're talking about to be able to ask them good questions. Otherwise, it's boring. And so I'm always studying for for the main show. And then, you know, you're doing homework on people, because if you invite somebody on to talk about their book and you clearly haven't read their book, like, yes. you know, that was like a famous Larry King thing is he never read anybody's book. He's like, so what's your book about? You know, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've never done interviews and I specifically started doing a talk radio show for like it's the, the Sunday morning public affairs program where I interview people just to get better at it. And now that I have more, more time and more confidence, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to start talking to people like you and Mary Ruart and, Ken Bassan. Trisha, and you had did that live stream with Trisha recently. Trisha right? Stewart, man of Gingerarchy, a great person, always speaks very highly of you. Oh, and that's sweet. That's really cool. So let's let's talk about what the Tenth Amendment Center is. When did it start? Why did you start it? Give us all the details. Well, I started. I'm a former. Well, not former. <laughs> I'm a current anti-war activist, but my primary political activism really started uh, primarily out of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is where I started becoming aware of a lot of propaganda and uh, imperialism and thing like that. But what really got me active was the, the first day that the bombs started dropping in Iraq in 2003. I was out protesting uh, with uh, Answer Coalition, if you're familiar with Answer, and California Peace Action in front of of the uh, the veterans building in West Los Angeles and almost got run over by a, a a cop vehicle and war to me was always a big issue and I recognized over time as I was I actually did a lot of organizing I'm a former club promoter so I spent a lot of time in nightclubs in San Francisco Los Angeles in the Midwest and I I've always been about bringing people together over an issue. So I used to do, for example, here in LA, it used to be, you'd think LA is a really progressive type of place, but in the 1990s, if you were in a gay club, you were only around gay people. And if you were in a straight club, you were only around straight people. So what I did, uh, like 96, 97, I took what I had, which was a pretty interesting, well, say an interesting, open-minded, straight crowd and brought them into West Hollywood and took them to a gay club to mix people together because the, the notion was to celebrate life through music. And it didn't matter who you were around. You would just spend time with other people. So I've always been a type of person that wants to bring people together over an issue. And to me, once it was... <laughs> And I just guess I was just clueless what was going on before that, but the Iraq war in 2003, whatever iteration of that it was, it just got me like motivated to say, you know what, it doesn't matter what our differences are, are on other things, something has to be done about mass murder. So. I started getting involved in a lot of these organizations, but then over time I got a little disillusioned. And I think I was listening to a lot of Harry Brown at the time, uh, the late, great Harry Brown, uh, probably. I, maybe we should call him Mr. Liber Libertarian one of these days. The guy was just so good at communicating issues to where people are on those issues. So I was listening to him and I just recognized that most of the anti-war uh, movement at the time was really either just anti-Bush, which was good because the guy's a monster, 
or it was just pro something else. They didn't want to do war because it took away from the ability of the state to actually supposedly provide health care or education. And that really kind of disillusioned me. So I wasn't involved actively. And I kind of stumbled across this idea of setting up this organization. I actually found one called First Amendment Center. And I'm like, whoa, that's a pretty good marketing idea. And so I actually bought a bunch of domains, Fourth Amendment Center, Fifth Amendment Center, Tenth Amendment Center. I didn't buy second. I don't have four and five anymore, but 10 was kind of, it kind of was an interesting one. And people were really interested in hearing about a constitutional view during the Bush administration saying that, well, everything that these so-called small government people, these, these Republicans who are just terrible, were doing was violating the constitution. It could have been Patriot Act, War on Drugs, the Real ID Act, all the surveillance and control, and of course the foreign policy. Is that the short version? Yeah, no, it's really interesting to hear that because I've been thinking so much about that lately because you know, I was a, f- a former Republican pro Bush, college Republican really or yeah. And you know, that's so that's you I came up in that stew. And so I would think that like the Tenth Amendment Center guy kind of came more from yes. like you expect like some old grizzled dude talking about you know uh, well like Michael Bagnarik or talking about the Constitution as a whole or you know so to hear the Ted you, Cruz yeah uh, no 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 uh, well yeah like, but that's so you know it's interesting that you kind but of those uh, are the people that the really left. misrepresent this stuff though I'm sorry but Ted Cruz and Mark Levin and these right. warmongering neocons they're the ones that kind of hold the mantle and so they piss me off more than anybody i'm sorry i'm sorry go ahead no it's it's but it's interesting because now i have a a, a ton of books but like i was just thumbing through bruce fine's book the other day Mm. because of the you know the capital insurrection now all of the talk about we need to crack down on domestic terrorists yeah and you go back and you look at some of the bush era books from you know uh from like jacob hornberger's organization and an affiliated folks sidman uh at Richmond. Sybil Edmonds. Oh, okay. uh, I can't think of his Sheldon name. Sheldon Richmond. Sheldon Richmond. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Bruce Fine and some of these other folks who were taking on Bush and the Republican Party at that time and talking about civil liberties, and it it feels like when when I joined in 2007, the the libertarian movement was as anti Republican as they were anti Democrat. Yeah. And I don't know what happened the last five years, but I'm still anti-Republican and anti-Democrat. And everybody yes. else is kind of like, eh, Trump's OK. Uh, so, oh, it, God, he is a monster. <laughs> it really is. interesting. I mean, but they all are. Let's think right. about that. The U.S. federal government, the well, I mean, it's a, I call it the imperial government because that's really what it is. It's the largest government in the face of of the world. It's the largest government in the history of the planet. Supposedly, Trump and his people were there to protect us from socialism. But the US federal government, this imperial government, spends approximately seven to eight times the amount that the communist government does in China. So you can't defend, you can't defeat socialism by being better socialists than they are in the first place. So like these people are terrible. And I actually, so sometimes people will say like, Bolden, why do you go so hard after some of these Republicans? Maybe we can ally with them on on stuff. And I'm like, you know, I'll work with anybody doing the right thing on a single issue. But when they're represented as being the party of small government, the supporters of the Constitution, but it's only supporters of the Constitution on one or two issues, then I really take issue with that. Because when it comes to things like the drug war and surveillance and militarization of police and foreign policy and debt and all kinds of other nasty stuff and Trump's attempts to go after the Tenth Amendment on things like sanctuary cities or immigration sanctuary cities and things like that, they're just not constitutionalists. And they're very, very big government socialists all around. So let's start with the Tenth Amendment Center view of, you know, first, why don't you just tell us about what you do now, not how it started, but what, what, if I tune into Tenth Amendment Center's YouTube channel, which I do quite often, or Tenth TenthAmendmentCenter.com, cool. what am I going to see? All kind. I mean, there's literally on our website, there's about 12,000 articles and blogs. I do a three time a week live stream and podcast uh, talking about either history. So what we try to do is we treat, teach people about 
the Constitution as the founders and ratifiers gave us. So the, what the founders had to say about the Constitution can inform us, but what gave it legal force was the people of the several state, because really the top of the food chain is the people. The people hold sovereignty or final authority. So we try to teach people about how things are supposed to be, and then we try to provide them tools to actually reject unconstitutional, at least federal actions, primarily, well, if we're talking about the largest government in the history of the world, that's probably striking the root the most. We teach people how to actually stand up for the Constitution and liberty without waiting on the government to limit its own power, which will never, ever, ever happen. So that's what you're going to get, and we can get into some details about that if you like. Let's start with the original vision of federalism and what the Tenth Amendment, well, tell us what the Tenth Amendment says and what was the founders' vision for the American government? Well, so one of the greatest concerns about, especially during the ratification debates, whether it was pro-Constitution or anti, and they were terms of art, Federalist and Anti-Federalist. Uh, in fact, Anti-Federalists really considered the term Anti-Federalist to be a term of propaganda because they were like, man, you guys are actually trying to centralize a little bit more than what we had before. We're actually the true Federalists. So, but I'll use those terms anyways, just because it tells us what side people are on. So whatever side they were on at the time, one of the greatest concerns, even though the Federalists weren't concerned about what they were setting up, was what they called the consolidation of power. They thought the greatest danger across the board, they were concerned about centralization of power, because whatever power, and this is kind of a Harry Brown thing, whatever power you give them to do something today for something you care about or something you like, will eventually be in the hands of someone to do the opposite at some point in the future. And that should be pretty obvious. And I think the Founders were much better students of history than we are today, and they recognize that all through history, when you give them power to do something or you set a new precedent, that will always be expanded. So the concern was whether or not to give them more power or not. And so the, the Constitution itself was probably going to fail approval ratification early on. We're talking about early 1788. And, uh, you know, Pennsylvania ran, De Delaware ran through ratification. But when you got to a place like Massachusetts, Massachusetts this is like the cradle of like, they can, I will call it the cradle of liberty. This is Sons of Liberty, Boston Tea Party, Samuel Adams, James Otis Jr., Hancock, Theophilus Parsons, so many people that were well known, John Adams, it was probably going to lose there. They did early counts in January of 1788. They were expecting it to lose because they thought it was going to centralize too much power. And so they finally came up with a deal to say, look, if we can suggest some amendments to the Constitution, can you get on board? And famously, probably not famously, but for those of us who've studied this, it was a Federalist named Theophilus Parsons, who was a great orator and legal mind in Massachusetts, working with some other Federalists to make a deal with Governor John Hancock and Samuel Adams, who had been mostly silent during the ratification, to be like, okay, we'll get on board if we can agree that you guys are all going to promise to do amendments. And what was the first amendment that Massachusetts recommended in their ratification document was what became the 10th Amendment. And other states like Virginia followed suit. So the concern was, as long as we can say, look, the stuff that is authorized to you is that is it. Everything else is reserved to the states or to the people as the people in each state determine, then we'll go ahead and do this. And that's really what the 10th Amendment is all about. It's a line in the sand to say, the feds have been delegated certain powers. James Madison in Federalist 45 specifically said, the powers delegated to the proposed constitution are few and defined, and those reserved to the states, state governments are numerous and indefinite. So in other words, all the stuff that would affect the lives and liberties of the people would be made closer to home. So if we're talking about advancing individual liberty, the closer that we can get to the individual with a government de decision, the greater chance we'll have that liberty will actually take hold and expand. Yeah, I think that the, the, the view of, I mean, is anarcho-capitalism was just sort of, uh, it, it's expanded, I think, within libertarian circles, and constitutional conservatism is seen more as uh, statism. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, you, I get that all the time. I've never voted, though. Right, but what you just outlined, it sounds like the founders were very libertarian and very concerned with the individual's ability to thrive and to, you know, exercise their lives as they see fit without 
much intervention unless they could directly affect the laws that were being crafted over them. Like, go go ahead. Thomas Jefferson, in his first inaugural address, March of 1801, specifically said it's the policy, and I'm paraphrasing, it's the, he was a terrible speaker, great writer, uh, but he was basically saying, it's the policy of my administration to just not interfere with people or take the fruits of their labor. That's it. We're just going to actually solve things where people are harming each other. That's it. We're not going to like take their stuff or tell them what to do. People can make their own free choices. And that really was the policy at the time. Now, we can talk a little bit about slavery, too, because that certainly was a problem that was certainly... Uh, man, I don't even know the right word to say that, because on the one hand, you have all these great ideals about individual liberty, about restricting government. But at the same time, you have this cognitive dissonance in some ways. Oppression. And I think a lot I mean, of people outright but, oppression. And I mean, it was yeah. horrifying. Well, Thomas Paine was a really good one on this, for example, when he first got off the boat and he came here, kind of came to the United States or to America, broke like without a job, he just came with a, a letter of recommendation from Benjamin Franklin to get a job. And he got hired at this really kind of no name, crappy publication in Philadelphia. And he just started writing. People recognized, whoa, this guy is pretty amazing. But one of the first things that he wrote, so he arrived in late 1774, like three months later, he literally published a tract railing on slavery. And the idea that and there was a weird moral understanding at the time, and I'm not sure how this happens, and I haven't really studied it enough, but the understanding was, as long as you didn't make the first purchase, as long as you weren't the first person to purchase a slave, and you were just repurchasing, somehow you weren't morally culpable in most of society or in a lot of it. And Payne actually went after that. Like, look, he said, look, a human being has a natural right to their freedom, and they can reclaim that anytime they want, no matter how many times they're bought or sold. So he was recognizing that no matter what had happened in the past, he was attacking that. Whatever happened at that past, we all have a natural right to our freedom. And he said specifically, if we're going to have government, government's job in this should actually be to punish people who are actually owning slaves. So there was some very good thought on this. It certainly wasn't very popular in society at the time, unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> that's to, to he say called it a wickedness. I think it was a it's a good term for it. Absolutely. So, th how quickly does the idea of the Tenth Amendment and uh, and the breakdown between power resting in the states and the growth of a central government? How quickly does that start to break down in the early American experiment? Almost immediately, we've got the whiskey tax, for example. <laughs> I mean, everyone from Abigail Adams to Samuel Adams to George Washington to John, they all warned us that power corrupts. I mean, that's that old kind of that old kind of phrase, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. But we also know that power is ever expanding. Even if it isn't corrupting, it always seeks to grow. So no matter who you have, human beings are human beings were very fallible. And when there's power, people who want power are drawn to that. And when there's a lot of power, the really, really bad people like today are definitely drawn to that. So it happened pretty quickly. Whiskey tax. There was the first national bank, Thomas Jefferson, February 15th, 1791. He made his arguments against the national bank on 10th Amendment ground, specifically saying to take a single step beyond the limits of the Constitution is to take control over a boundless field of power because he recognized like the penman of the revolution John Dickinson recognized in the 1760s against the hated Townsend Acts, that as soon as you establish one small precedent, government will always use that as a floor rather than a ceiling to their power. So this happened pretty quickly. Uh, and I mean, <laughs> it just keeps going. So sooner or later, people have to learn how to actually limit that power to stand up for their liberty, whether government wants them to or not. And that's really my view on it. Okay, so who? Well, let's kind of take a couple of the two, three highlights between there and here. Like, <laughs> yeah. all right. So, and maybe we use president. Like, what are some of the the biggest usurpations of power by the federal government upon the states? Uh, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was huge. It tried to turn all the northern states into slave catchers for the South. I know a lot of people think, for example, nullification, which we can talk about. I mean, that's certainly a huge part of our work here at TAC. 
is really just some kind of racist garbage. Uh, but in fact, it was nullification by northern states opposing a centralized slave catching law throughout the 1850s, which actually led states like South Carolina to secede and complain about that nullification of the federal fugitive slave law. I think that Millard Fillmore, I think was the president, was one of the worst. The Alien and Sedition Acts in 1798, which is an attack on free speech. We've seen some people recently saying, oh, maybe the Sedition Act had some good ideas. Uh, that really drove Jefferson and then Madison uh, into office uh, in uh, 1800 and then 1808, 1809. Uh, of course, the Patriot Act is a really, really bad one as well. Uh, I mean, and I would think all the ways that we have executive war making power, I think, really has impact on the entire globe. So the idea that instead of having a declaration of war from Congress as required by Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 and 16, one of those off the top of my head, requires Congress to declare war before you can actually engage in conflict with another country that hasn't directly attacked you, uh, that the executive branch can just decide to drop bombs on somebody. And as long as it's just limited and it's not like a full army invasion, this is really led. It's not a specific law, but it's a series of acts, Truman and beyond. And basically all the presidents since then have really looked at themselves at like the King of England. This was something that the founders specifically specifically told us they did not want to be like England, the empire, where one person had the decision uh, over the power to declare and to make war. Now, declare doesn't necessarily just have to be a piece of paper. If you launch a missile at somebody, you've declared that you're at war with them. So uh, the, the notion that you're going to change the status of the nation from war to peace with another country is not supposed to be in the hands of one person, because one person is far more corruptible uh, than maybe maybe a few hundred. Can you talk about why war is so destructive to a free society? What is it about war that just erodes liberties faster than anything else? That's exactly what I think. So I'm just going to cite James Madison. Again, it's a paraphrase. And this was in a series of debates uh, over war powers in the 1790s. I think he was writing as Helvidius. Maybe it was paper number three or something like that. But he basically said, war is the greatest threat to the public liberty because war gives us armies. And from armies, we get debts and taxes. And in Madison's words, armies, debts, and taxes are the known instruments for putting the many under the domination of the few. Uh, I mean... I think he's smarter than me, and I'm just going to go with that one. So let's talk. I mean, in I read a book last summer about Henry Clay and the lead up to the uh, it's Robert Remini's book about like the the Great Precipice right before the Civil War. And I have never read it. It was it good. It's really good. Yeah, short too, uh, <laughs> which I like. Um, but he <sighs> talks a lot about the compromises, you know. And you mentioned the Great the, the Fugitive Slave Act, which was so inflaming to the north i mean yes being from indiana and you always hear about lincoln but the the reality is most people in the north were white supremacists who didn't just kind of had had their media was just like oh this is good for them this is helpful to them it's it's helpful that they're oppressed because it's takes care of them how would they fend for themselves without it um and abolitionists were just kind of freaks <laughs> until yeah. union soldiers started to go down into see for themselves during the civil war what was happening to black people and then all of a sudden attitudes started to shift quickly but even before that the north being forced into returning freed slaves was Huge. just a bridge too far but politicians at the time saw okay we've got to keep this together and we've got to make these compromises because if we break apart then all these bad things will happen and I get the sense that I'm probably more of a, a conciliatory person than you might be, but I wonder, um, uh, which, which is what Trish always says. She's like, I think you like government too much. And I'm like, no, it's just that I just don't think all government, all anybody who draws a government paycheck is evil. Um, but like where, where's the line between, compromising and, and classical liberalism where you have these different groups of people who have differing interests in a society like America versus just what is moral and immoral, right? Like, yeah. if that question makes sense, I think maybe the pandemic kind of plays into this because yeah. 
it's if you look at um you know i was a big proponent of voluntarily staying home for a, a few weeks but like when you're telling me that i have to shelter in place and you're going to arrest me if i go get a haircut it's 12 months later then we've got a real problem right like um I, I think that tension between, and you see it into the George Floyd stuff. So I don't know if this mm -hmm. question totally makes sense, but I feel like you're a good person to ask, like, how how do we kind of meet in the middle without uh, giving away any liberty, if that makes sense? Ooh. I don't know if you can actually, I think meeting in the middle is and of itself, it is giving away liberty. Uh, and I think federalism is actually the way forward in this, localism. So people have bad views on stuff. I probably, I mean, we, I guess he could try to figure out what my crappy ones are. Maybe this is one, but I don't think people are going to do well when they're forced. I don't want a libertarian dictator, for example. If you try to force people to do something or you try to like, what's gonna happen? I think you will generate even more resistance in the long run. So uh, there is no, there has been no solution to issues over race that have actually come through violence. I think it's through example and through learning. I personally was a homophobe when I was growing up, and I don't even know if that's the right term anymore, but that's what we used in the, like, in the 80s and the early 90s. And where I actually learned that people are people, no matter who they decide to be with or decide to not be with or who they buy their very genetic makeup are going to be with or not. I learned that by just living amongst other people when I moved to Los Angeles. I grew up in Wisconsin, which was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which maybe it still is, was a highly segregated area. And of course, this is pre-internet, so we weren't communicating with a lot of people. We're living in little silos, which I think is actually a bad thing when people are basically uh, balkanized, I guess, over everything, over their views, over lifestyles and things like that. So when I personally came to Los Angeles and was just exposed to other lifestyles and being around other human beings that were just totally different from me all day, every day, everywhere I went, that's what opened my mind more than anything ever done by government, at least in my own personal experience. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, that, that was my point about like, you see the NCAA, which is headquartered here in Indianapolis, you know, willing to forego the Mar March Madness for the good of the country, and the NBA giving it up. Everybody's like, yay, rah, yay, rah. And then all of a sudden the CDC guidelines come out from Trump and, and the CDC states start shutting down. And it's like a, a switch just flipped last year. You know, anytime the government tells people what to do, yes. there's a backlash. Anytime yes. you censor, there's a backlash. But the I, the ideas of kind of what you're talking about, the localism, I guess is the way to put it, is it forces us into community and talking with each other and getting to know each other better. And that's one of the beautiful things about freedom is that you, it seems counterintuitive, right? Like if you just kind of loosen the Chinese finger trap and let people live their lives as they see fit, all of the yes. sudden you have more harmony. I think over time, I think we're actually going through a real pain period. And I know a lot of people like to blame social media for kind of uh, promoting really bad ideas. But I think all of these so-called, whatever anyone's view is, if you are just being made aware of a lot of people having a really bad idea according to you, those ideas have been there all along. You're just, you should just be thankful for social media for exposing it. It's like we're ripping off a band aid. And I think it's going to take a few generations of what we're living under today and maybe getting worse before things can actually start getting better. So let's talk about our relationship with the government or the state, depending on your view. Um, I don't look cops in the eyes. They have laser eyes and they frighten me. <laughs> it's you know, true. I live in downtown Los Angeles. And during those uh, uh, the BLM protests, I mean, one of the times I popped out on my balcony, I'd moved during the pandemic, which is a kind of an interesting thing. Uh, but I literally moved the week that that started. And so we were starting to get notifications on our phone like, oh, uh, curfew at 10 o'clock. And then 15 minutes later, curfew at eight o'clock. And then 15 minutes later, curfew at six o'clock clock and my partner Sarah she's trying to bring stuff over while I'm loading stuff in the apartment it's like holy crap and then you look out on the balcony and there's a squad of squat people pulling pointing guns at your building I mean they're, wow. they're scary scary fuckers I don't know how else to put it I do not like 
government enforcement goons at all. But uh, maybe I'm going off on a tangent. No, no, no. I, I, you know, we just interviewed a small business owner from Fresno ampersand ice cream, Jeff Bennett. And I got to tell you, like the experience when I talked to my friend, Mark Claire, who, you know, is from oh. Elf of Lanza, yeah, yeah. Or, or somebody like you or Brian Nichols in Philly, uh, you know, Remzo, one of our hosts just came to, to Indianapolis and he lives in Northern Virginia in the DC area. And he can't believe it. Like people are in shops, they're in restaurants, they're inside, there's no masks anywhere. Like, you know, like you go to Newcastle, Indiana, it's like, what's a mask, right? Like it, it, it really exposes, I think, this federal idea of how different the pandemic experience I had, like we stayed home for two months, but then you did whatever you want by July 4th, right? Like you're going, I got my hair cut yesterday. There isn't one person in there wearing a mask. You know, yeah. the barbershop's full, like it's, it's personal choice as to your personal lever, level of exposure to the virus. But when I talk to you guys in LA, <laughs> it's not just the unpredictability that you just yeah. mentioned. It is so starkly different. And so I think that's part of why, you know, the lockdown stuff doesn't really move me. Like, I, I, you know, it's like, well, I mean, you know, there's a real virus and stuff, but I'm not experiencing it in the same way that right. like what you just described um, has the pandemic and, and the lockdown specifically, has that really shown you and the, and the 10th amendment center folks, like the differences in how important a governor is? No, I mean, they all suck. So, and I don't think that's actually changed anything. And we don't really do a lot of work uh, regarding state level violations of individual liberty. There's just other organizations to do that. And we're almost underwater dealing with the feds as it is. I mean, they're just all bad. I mean, Newsom's bad. Schwarzenegger was bad. They're all bad. Abbott is bad. Who's the governor in Indiana now? Also bad. I don't know who it is or what he or she has done, but bad. Correct, I just yeah. don't trust them. They all have too much power. They're in bed with the empire. And we know this because the last so-called federal shutdown, and I'm not sure, but the one in the during the Obama administration, 2013, 2014, yeah. uh, the National Governors Association put out a press release. They were very concerned about what was going on. And in their words, the reason was is because, quote, states are partners with the federal government on most federal programs. Almost every federal program that exists is really implemented and enforced with a partnership with state and local government agencies, law enforcement, et cetera. So uh, I really kind of follow the money and the uh, kind of connect the dots. And a lot of times the worst things that local and state governments are doing, it's because they're participating in federal programs. So if you look at cops, for example, why are they so militarized? Well, we have uh, the Edward Byrne JAG grant program from the Department of Justice, of course, the 1033 militarization program, the Department of Homeland Security grant program, supposedly for the war on drugs. The first two are actually from the late 80s and early 90s to support the war on drugs, which shouldn't exist in the first place either. And has expanded to turn uh, what would probably be at some point decades and decades ago, peace officers into an occupying force in many ways. S SWAT teams come from this, from the federal government, because then we also have federal local joint task forces. There's like 500 of these to do plant control gun control, whatever it may be. And when local agents participate in federal joint task forces, they're actually de deputized as federal agents. So they're on the local dime, but they're acting under federal priorities. And this is a serious problem in basically every avenue of government that exists out there, whether it's environmental regulations, health regulations, the size of my toilet, what plant I can, well, not as much on the plant on what I can purchase because here in Los Angeles, and I haven't looked at the numbers, but it peaked out at some point around 1700 marijuana stores. This is more than Starbucks and 7-Eleven combined. And this to me shows that when people say no in large numbers and either local or state governments back them up with something to authorize them to do something that the feds said that they can't, there's not much that Washington DC can do to force their so-called laws or regulations or mandates down our throats. Yeah, you kind of saw that this past year that they, the enforcement side, they're, they're kind of weak, but it's the money that, that, that they control. Like this, this became glaringly evident to me when I served on the state help, help America vote act commission. And they were giving the state $12 million. And this commission was formed to pick from 
a list of like five things that the federal government wanted you to do. Really? And you could fund two of them <laughs> with the amount of money they were giving you. But there were th- there were three other things that you needed to do that you weren't going to be given the money for, and you had to just find the budget. And so it just wow. it fed into the unfunded mandate stuff. And so controlling these states, how much has the – like are states and loca- localities just – organs dependent on the federal government at this point or is there still a way out through things like nullification well yes and yes so in (laughs) essence they asked almost entirely as organs or as maybe oversized counties because there's there's some variation but i think if we talk about weed and immigration we actually see a path forward we Hmm. see again like Back in the day, I used to think that if the Supreme Court said something uh, was illegal or you couldn't do something, that anyone who had a law saying you could do that would repeal it. So in 2005, the famous Gonzalez versus Rach case, this is the the weed case filed by a great hero who should have streets named after her, Angel Rach, who literally at the time had a, a, a tumorous cancer, like a massive cancer tumor in her head, where she was recommended by her doctor here in California under Prop 215 passed by voters in 1996 to allow the use of cannabis for certain limited medical purposes at the time, uh, that she was using cannabis us to treat this and we're learning now because uh, you know the government has actually prevented research on this for so many years that actually there's some research showing that cannabis can actually help eat cancer cells now i'm not a doctor and i should not maybe i shouldn't even say things like that, but these are things that i'm reading maybe we'll learn that over time but this was prevented from people for so many years and she was doing this and surviving and her and her caregiver i can't remember the name they grew six plants in their home And government goons from Washington, D.C. and the local county sheriff's department came in and stomped them out. It's basically like they were sitting there going, supremacy clause, you can't do this. We don't care what your state law has said. We don't care if you're dying from cancer. That's how government, in my view, will treat people who are dying and using an illegal plant that is natural, the cannabis plant. She went to court and she lost. She lost in 2005. You can't do this anyways. At the time that the Gonzalez versus Rage case was decided, there were 10 states with medical marijuana laws on the books. Today, it's not just 10 states with medical. What is it, like 11 now or 11 or 12-ish with full legal? We're going to have more in the near future, whether it's uh, New Jersey or Delaware or Connecticut or Virginia, full recreational. All Plus, the there's states, 36, 36 states total. All the states around uh, like the state police officially say that every 200 250 cars coming across the border from illinois and michigan are just packed with weed but Good. privately they'll tell you it's one out of every hundred and oh wow the, <laughs> the pressure in this state for there's the eli Lilly, anthem all these all these you know beholden the, the politicians are beholden to medical industry money yes and so they're not interested in cannabis in any way shape or form they you know they begrudgingly allow hemp now um but the states around us allowing this are now putting a lot of citizen pressure on politicians to make Mm -hmm. a different choice and it's not just coming from millennials it's coming from baby boomers oh yeah yeah, they want to make the money or they want access i've met so many people over the years who are who have literally learned by example and this is a great I think this is actually probably our best example of how this actually, or this nullification, you could call it something else. I know some people hate it when I call marijuana legalization an act of nullification, but in essence, that to me is what's happening. They have laws on the books in Washington, DC. Every branch of the federal government says this is illegal. The Supreme Court says it doesn't matter what the states do. This is federal law, the Controlled Substances Act, we've got uh, international treaties, doesn't matter. This is illegal and you can't do it. But 36 states, millions and millions of people are doing it anyway. And people are making billions of dollars. There's a lot of money to be made in this industry as well. So this does create a lot of pressure. And I'll tell you, 
10 years ago when I would tell people nullification is weed and I would talk in front of like Republican groups, they would want to boo me out of the room and I didn't care. And I would actually, I would actually, I'd win some people over, but today it's really the other way around. No one's really complaining. Even people who don't necessarily like it are like, you know what? That is a choice to the people of California. Even if I think California shouldn't be in part of the country anymore, that's the kind of thing that I'll hear because people learn from experience. They learn from example that when someone owns something, they sell something, they consume something, as long as they're not harming other people, the world doesn't come to an end. Now we can do the same type of thing. I've been urging gun rights activists to take the same strategy and use it for that, or to look at immigration sanctuary cities and wonder why are you complaining right winger about this? You're complaining because what they're doing in these immigration sanctuaries works. You wouldn't complain about it if it was just hurting your feeling. Well, maybe, yeah, <laughs> I'm <come sure>. on. <laughs> but, but no the reason that a lot of people on the right complain about immigration sanctuary cities or the SB 54, the sanctuary state law here in California, the one that's been on the books for decades in Oregon is because it has a direct impact on the federal government's ability to enforce federal immigration law because relying on state and local help, the, here's the dirty little secret. Partnerships don't work too well when half the team quits. And we should actually apply this to anything and everything, whether it's on a state or a very local level. Let me put on my John Stossel hat now. Oh, nice. But, but we believe in the rule of law, which is a foundational principle of liberty. And if states and local authorities just decide to stop participating, don't you have anarchy? Don't you have a total breakdown? Don't, shouldn't they follow the law as set by the federal government? Hmm. Should we? That's my John Stossel impression. I'm asking you. Would John Stossel ask that? No. Uh, no. That, well, <laughs> I think if you, that's the argument that you will get from a lot of people is that, well, you can't, you can't have, because I've argued this with a local commentator named Abdul. And he's like, you can't just pick and choose what laws the state of Indiana is going to follow from the federal government. Okay. Well, let's go through that. Why not? Every, <laughs> every single founder would have said, Yes, you can pick and choose which law you're going to follow from the federal government. James Madison, in fact, in Federalist number 46, arguing to primarily a New York audience to ratify the Constitution. Mind you, he was one of the big government guys at the time. He specifically said there was a four-step plan to undermine and defeat federal programs. Not one of them included going to federal courts in the hopes that federal courts would limit federal power or voting bums out. In fact, he specifically said that states and individuals should utilize a, quote, refusal to cooperate with officers of the union. And now mind you, Madison didn't say that we should do this only for things that we saw were unconstitutional. He said, and he used different words, he used either warrantable measures or unwarrantable. So warrantable meaning those which are authorized by the constitution. So if you think something's just bad policy, what did Madison say? Refuse to cooperate with officers of the union. If you think something is unconstitutional, what did Madison say? A refusal to cooperate with officers of the union. James Iredell, the third Supreme Court justice appointed by George Washington specifically says, when the federal government would usurp power usurp meaning exercise power, not delegate it to it, the people will resist. He didn't say the people will vote the bums out. He said the people will resist. This is a long standing tradition. It goes all the way back to the arguments against the writs of assistance in 1761, the resistance to the British for decades. James Otis Jr. specifically said an act against the constitution, this was an unwritten constitution at the time, is void. Patrick Henry against the Stamp Act in 1765 said the people are not bound to yield obedience to tax laws passed by the far off government because there's a line in the sand where only the local government or the colonial government is authorized to do it. This is like a pre 10th amendment argument, but this was an established principle that they lived through and that they established in the constitution for the United States in 1787 and 1788. So the, the next objection that you would get is, won't they pull your highway funding? <laughs> you, you did a video on this. I hear that once in a while too, and we're talking. Well, we can go back and a guy named, man, I think it's Ryan Fournier. Do you know the name? Fournier, yeah, it's some something French like that, yeah. He basically said, uh, this is just a kind of a claptrap right wing garbage take, but he basically was saying, Donald Trump should just pull 
all federal funding from states that don't want to participate in enforcing federal immigration law. That's what, and a lot of people agreed with that. But the fact of the matter is, uh, Trump had threatened to do that. And the reason that didn't happen is because there is a line in the sand. It's something that's called coercion. Now, first of all, James Madison's advice in Federalist 46, it's not just some arcane legal strategy. It's not just from uh, people like James Iredell who was saying, you know, resist them. This is not just some old school garbage. This has actually been uh, supported and verified by the Supreme Court in a series of five major cases from 1842 to 2018 in something called the Anti-Commandeering Doctrine. And the short version of that legal doctrine is that the federal government, I mean, we can debate what the federal government is authorized to do, but let's just say the federal government is authorized to do whatever the hell it wants. In essence, that's how it acts, acts in practice. So let's just give them everything. The Supreme Court itself, who is part of the federal government, tells us that no matter what the federal government does, it cannot actually require states to expend personnel or any other resources to implement or effectuate or enforce federal acts or regulatory programs. It started with the 1842 Prigg case. This is where Justice, Justice Joseph Story said that states like Pennsylvania, Indiana, Ohio, elsewhere did not, maybe not Indiana in that one, but Ohio, specifically Pennsylvania and elsewhere, did not have to use resources to implement the Federal Fugitive Slave Act of 1793. So this is a longstanding tradition. The most recent one was in 2018. This is Murphy versus NCAA. This is a sports betting case. And Samuel Lito said, like, the federal government cannot command states to do things or stop doing things, even if the state action is in conflict with federal law. And in his words, this is for the majority, and I think it was 7-2 in that one. In his words, he said, like, a, a more direct affront on state sovereignty is not easy to imagine. This is just totally repugnant to the American system. So absolutely, states can pick and choose which federal programs, which federal acts they want to participate in. Now, does that mean that they'd have to give up money that was directly related to it? Yes, but the idea that the federal government can just take away all, all funding or all highway funding is nonsense. And another case is South Dakota versus Dole in 1987. And a lot of times, and Ryan, this guy, Ryan, actually, he actually cited this as backing him up. And it's just, it's just silly to me, because if you actually know what happened in that case, it's really the other way around. What happened was this was uh, about raising uh, the drinking age and the feds wanted to withhold uh, some highway funding and the Supreme Court actually upheld it. And the reason was, is they said the amount wasn't coercive. What they were authorized to do, and it's a little bit of a gray area there, but the feds can in essence withhold about 5% of funding that is directly related to the issue at hand. So they couldn't actually take away education funding if a state decided to not participate in drug war enforcement, for example. But they could take away some police funding. As long as it's not coercive, 5% in the first year was South Dakota versus Dole and 10% every year thereafter. So they said a small part of the overall budget, I can't remember what fraction of the state's total budget was amount was the amount, but they said as long as it wasn't coercive. And this idea of coercion came up in the famous Obamacare case, the Sibelius, NFIB versus Sibelius. Uh, uh, where they were trying to force states to expand, I think it was, was it their Medicaid rolls or Medicare? I don't, Medicaid rolls, right? And they said, look, the idea of doing this is coercion. They don't have to do this if they don't want to. They can literally opt out. You can't just take away funding that was promised for one thing because they decide not to do something else a little bit later on. So we have a lot of uh, information from the founders specifically saying that's, that states can pick and choose in essence. And then of course we have the Supreme Court repeatedly, consistently backing this up over and over and over, over the years saying, yes, states do not have to participate in the enforcement of federal acts or regulatory programs. One final question, because you've been generous with your time. Um, We're already done. I mean, we could go for two more hours, I'm sure. But... I know there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> oh, we haven't gotten to Biden. I mean, please. Um, oh, man. You know, a lot of I'm all for nullification and I love everything that we've talked about because I really do think it is a, a tremendous path forward and the way towards localism. Um, but I keep hearing succession, uh, secession mentioned a lot. And I'm much more skeptical about that concept because, like, if you want hyperinflation, start breaking the union apart. Where do you come down on – can you first explain what it is and where do you come down on it? 
seceding. So like uh, California becoming its own country, Texas becoming its own country, uh, New Hampshire, for example. Uh, I mean, the United States of America exists because of an act of secession. So philosophically, I'm on board with that. But strategically, I don't think it's actually a really good idea. We're talking again about the largest government in the history of the world, the largest empire, military empire in the history of the world by far. And we know they're willing to use tons of violence. Like and if people, people are telling me- 14 AR-15s to the, to the capital with 500 rounds, and then there's 25,000 troops the next week. <laughs> I just don't think it's a smart move. I actually appreciate the people who talk about it in theory and philosophy sometime in the future, and I don't think it'll be in my lifetime, maybe that's actually the way forward. But you don't get to the way forward on day one. And it takes, for things like this, we're talking years and years and years of building up the effort. So if, let's say, Texas, the people of Texas, there's a, a, a piece of legislation that's been filed there that would actually start the process to have a referendum. So let's say the people of Texas decide, and you know, we can argue what the people of Texas mean, but whatever, under their process, let's say they decide to secede. Would I want them to kill them? Absolutely not. Would I be concerned that the US federal government, whether it was a Biden or a Trump or a Hawley or whoever might want to? I would be very concerned about that. And I don't think people are ready for that type of thing. We're still learning that that weed can be an OK thing for people, not the idea. I mean, the, going from there to the next step, I think, is crazy, really, at this point. Jefferson himself, who was a secessionist and actually suggested suge secession as a possible follow up to uh, efforts to nullify the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. He suggested this in letters in 1799 and, and uh, throughout the year, but he didn't actually think that secession was really the right first step. He saw something as nullification as what he called the moderate middle ground between unlimited submission and a bloody war for secession. We, I think we need to try more and more of this on more and more issues before, I guess, jumping the gun. Uh, so far, the most effective nullification efforts have really come from the left and the right has been way behind but hopefully maybe their partisanship and their hatred of biden will actually help them get on board and we can establish some of those efforts on the right to keep and bear arms and other issues that are important to people on the right and kind of even that out and then just keep pushing forward from there in the long run i don't think we actually need to see secession but uh maybe i'm incorrect on that i haven't thought about it a ton other than i just don't think it is the right strategy at this stage no, I feel like there's a lot of accelerationists who don't think through a lot of things when there's a lot of room still to maneuver uh, in, in a lot of areas. And the government in this country, it, yes, it is tremendously big and it has a lot of power and a lot of money, but it's still malleable. You know, it's not a, a giant state where it's like Bismarck's Germany. You know, it is it is you can. You know, here in Indiana, for instance, I don't know what it's like in L.A., but it, you can you can become an elite in Indiana for after like 15 years. <laughs> you know, if you just show up and work hard in the local political establishment, you can you can become somebody that is fairly influential um, and, and making policy in this state and then use that state to to sue. And that's sort of what we've seen with attorney generals, too, like in checking Trump and now in checking Biden and in checking the election results, the attorney generals have a tremendous amount of power in some of this stuff, do they not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't really follow a lot of lawsuits because it, I think that the Supreme Court every term gets requests for somewhere about 10,000 some odd cases and maybe wow. they take 100 and then maybe they, uh, you know, overturn two things. So I think it's a numbers game here. So that's probably best left for people who really want to work in the legal realm. We believe that rather than waiting two or four or six years for some new federal politicians to get into office and say, well, we're not going to use all that power you left us or waiting for permission from some federal judges to tell us, oh, now you can be free now. We think it's more important to actually start exercising our rights, start learning how to advance liberty, whether we get permission from Washington, D.C. or not. And the best example really is weed. We can also talk about immigration sanctuary cities. There's 300 some of these around the country. And whether you love them or hate them, the reason that people love or hate them is because not participating in federal enforcement has a very powerful impact on the ability of the federal government to enforce whatever it is. And we're starting to see some efforts now with Biden in office. We're starting to see some 
efforts once again, like we did when uh, Obama was in office to do the same thing on the right to keep and bear arms. Just this week, two committees in uh, Missouri passed a Second Amendment Preservation Act basically to ban the state from enforcing, using any resources to enforce any federal gun control measure past, present, or future. That is literally on fast track to get to the governor because the Speaker of the House, this is one of his three priority bills for the year in Missouri. There's also eight other states with similar legislation on the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, not Indiana, unfortunately, Chris, but uh, Texas, South Carolina, Arizona, Alabama, and a few others off the top of my head there. But uh, hopefully we'll start seeing this type of thing from the right as well. They'll learn that like you can't rely on Washington, D.C. to fix itself. And the more that we can localize things, the more we're going to have an impact on whatever is important to us. Now, I would give the same advice to a socialist, which I happen to be in the past. Don't try to get your view forced on the entire country. Just implement it in your own area. If you look at the history of the National Health Care Plan, in uh, in Canada, for example, that wasn't just a federal program. It started out in one province and people liked it and they expanded it. And I would have plenty of arguments against it, but if that's what people want to do, do it location by location. Don't use uh, the central government to try to force it on anybody because all the, what's going to happen is you're going to get so much pushback, it won't work. Yeah. And check out our interview with Hannah Cox on the death penalty because it's only just a couple of counties in the entire nation that are driving most of the deaths. I mean, They've been successful at concerned conservatives about the death penalty to to really like kill the death penalty in all of these Republican areas by, you know, we're conservatives. This is why we believe this. I mean, it's there's example after example after example showing the path that you've articulated today is a great path, a peaceful path to yeah. a more libertarian society. And I, I just love it. And I love what dude. It's do. the Rosa Parks method through and through. So big, big fan of the 10th Amendment Center. I, I thank you. you can all hear now why. Please, it's plug time. Tell people how they can follow you and learn more about what you're doing. Honestly, the best place for people to go really is 10th Amendment Center dot com slash report. It's all spelled out, so it's pretty long, but easy peasy. 10th Amendment Center dot com slash report. We publish an annual state of the nullification movement report. It's a free download for Kindle, which I don't think the formatting, but uh, all the all the different uh, ebook formats and PDF. It's 108 pages. The first half of it goes into all the detail, the constitutional and legal history, the court cases that I'm talking about in general, plus how it was implemented. This nullification tool was implemented in response to things like the Federal Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. And then we have the second half of that, about 45 pages or so, uh, is talking about how it's being used today on things uh, like the drug war, for example, militarization of police, uh, asset forfeiture and the like. Awesome. And I will put that in the show notes. So if you missed it, uh, then you can download that. Michael Bolden, thank you so much for joining me. You rule, man. I really appreciate you, uh, you having me on to just blab and blab and blab. Thank you so much. Anytime. I mean, my, our door is always open. And if you've got something that you want to talk about, uh, feel free to hit us up. And thank you cool. so much for coming on. Thank you so much for listening to The Chris Spangle Show. And we will see you all again very soon.